This recording is part two of two for the appendicular skeleton, your girdles and appendages. The femur, which you know is your thigh bone, is the longest and heaviest of all the bones in the skeleton. Similar to the humerus, the femur has a femoral head, which is the rounded proximal aspect of this bone. What you can't see in this picture is centrally located on the most proximal aspect of the head is a tiny pit or depression referred to as the fovea capitis. The fovea capitis serves as a ligamentous site of attachment between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the coxal bone forming that ball and socket joint. Just distal to the head of the femur is the neck of the femur or femoral neck. Laterally located and distal to the femoral neck, we find the greater trochanter. Medially and distally located to the greater trochanter is the lesser trochanter. Again, these pieces of bone stick out because of strong muscular attachment, which causes them to become more prominent. In between the two trochanters is the intertrochanteric line. On the posterior aspect between the two trochanters, we have the intertrochanteric crest. Also posteriorly located on the diaphysis of the femur is the linea aspera, which is a prominent line of bone that serves for a site of muscular attachment for some of the hamstring muscles. There are smooth curved surfaces at the very distal aspect of the femur. These are the medial femoral condyle and the lateral femoral condyle respectively. Remember a condyle is a smooth curved surface, whether it is a smooth curved cup-like surface or a smooth curved surface that sticks out such as on the femur, it's sometimes referred to as a condyle. We also have the medial and lateral epicondyles. You'll notice there is a groove anteriorly for the patella to ride when the knee goes through flexion and extension. This takes us to the quadriceps angle or Q angles, which is a measurement of the quadriceps muscle in relation to the patella. The larger the Q angle, the greater the chance the patella has of tracking laterally and going out of the patellar groove on the femur and causing problems with the patella. We'll discuss that a little bit later. This takes us to the tibia and the fibula. These are the bones of the leg. Remember the femur, which is the largest, heaviest bone in your body, is your thigh bone. The tibia and the fibula are your leg bones. You can see that the tibia and fibula, similarly to the radius and the ulna of the forearm, are also held together by means of an interosseous membrane. Let's look at the structures on these bones. Remember that a smooth curved surface is referred to as a condyle. We saw the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, and they are smooth curved surfaces that are rounded on their on their distal aspect. However, at the proximal aspect of the tibia, there's a smooth curved surface, and those are also referred to as condyles. Here we see the lateral condyle of the tibia and the medial 
condyle of the tibia is actually all the way at the top on the proximal aspect of the bone. In between the two condyles are the intercondylar eminences. These are the pieces of bone that stick up between the two condyles. In the anterior portion of the tibia, we see a lump that is called the tibial tuberosity. When children are developing, for those who play sports like soccer, where there's a lot of kicking and a lot of extension of the knee, that extension occurs because of the quadriceps femoris muscles that are responsible for knee extension. They attach at this tibial tuberosity and sometimes in kids, the pulling of the muscles on that structure in knee extension can cause that portion of the bone to avulse or tear away. That type of avulsion fracture is referred to as Osgood Schlatter's disease. It is self-limiting, which means that it will resolve on its own with rest and ice. The bone will repair itself if the activity is stopped. On the tibia, there is an anterior margin or crest that you can feel. You can actually feel it on your own leg if you run your fingers down your leg on the lateral aspect next to a muscle that you'll feel, that's tibialis anterior. If you flex your foot, dorsiflex, pulling the toes up to your knee, that's dorsiflexion, you'll feel that ridge of bone, the anterior border, which is also referred to as the anterior margin of the tibia. As we continue distally on the tibia, you'll notice there is a piece of bone that sticks downward on the medial aspect of the tibia. That is the medial malleolus. Pay attention to things that are on the medial aspect and things that are on the anterior aspect of bones because that will help you orient yourself when you're in lab. If you can find the tibial tuberosity on the tibia, you know that is anterior. And then the medial malleolus is the part of the tibia that goes down further on that bone. With the tibia, between the tibia and the fibula, the tibia is the bone of the two that bears weight. The fibula is not a weight-bearing bone. That's actually there for balance. The fibula has a head. So here we can see the head of the fibula. And as you go down to the distal aspect of the fibula, you will see the lateral malleolus of the fibula. The lateral malleolus sits lower on the distal aspect of the leg than does the medial malleolus. You can also feel this as you go down towards your ankle. If you feel where the medial malleolus ends and the lateral malleolus ends, you'll be able to feel that on yourself, how the lateral malleolus goes further distally. Remember, the tibia bears weight, the fibula does not. Here we have both anterior and posterior views of the tibia and the fibula. On these pictures, we can see the tibial tuberosity anteriorly the medial malleolus, the intercondylar eminence, 
the intercondylar eminence is between the condyles of the tibia, here we see the medial malleolus. That means that this is the medial condyle, and this is the lateral condyle. The fibula is always lateral to the tibia, just like the radius is lateral to the ulna. We can see the anterior margin of the tibia. You can feel that on the bone. Here we have the head of the fibula and the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Here we have the head of the fibula and the lateral malleolus again. All sesamoid bones have the unique characteristic of being embedded in tendons. It's common to see sesamoid bones embedded in the tendons that serve the hallux, which is the big toe, as well as the pollux sometimes, the thumb. The largest of all the sesamoid bones in the body is the patella, which is embedded in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle group. Remember that tendon attaches to the tibial tuberosity. In women, the quadriceps angle tends to be larger, and because there's a larger angle, one of the quadriceps femoris muscles called vastus lateralis tends to pull the patella laterally so it doesn't track properly in the patellar groove on the femur. That causes a roughening of the cartilage on the posterior aspect of the patella and anterior knee pain, known as chondromalacia of the patella. Depending on the severity of the lateral tracking, originally the first line of defense to resolve the problem is physical therapy. If that doesn't work, uh, oftentimes surgery will be required to stop the patella from tracking laterally. This takes us to the ankle and the foot. With the wrist, you'll remember we had eight carpals and five metacarpals. Keep the wrist and the ankle and the foot distinct. The wrist has eight carpals, the ankle has seven tarsals. Keep the terms separate and distinct. The ankle has seven tarsals and five metatarsals make up the foot. The most proximal of the tarsals is talus, followed distally by calcaneus. The talus has a smooth curved surface that forms a trochlea that allows for dorsiflexion and plantar flexion at the foot and ankle. The calcaneus is more commonly known as the heel bone. From the talus, we move distally and slightly anteriorly to navicular. Navicular helps you navigate towards the cuneiforms, of which there are three. There is a medial cuneiform, an intermediate cuneiform, and a lateral cuneiform. Then we see cuboid as the most lateral and distal of all the tarsals. Again, talus, calcaneus, navicular, medial, intermediate, lateral cuneiform, followed by cuboid. 
you'll notice that cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals in the metacarpals hamate articulates hamate articulates with the fourth and fifth metacarpals i'll say that again cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals right here in the wrist hamate articulates with the fourth and fifth metacarpals take a look check it out this takes us to the first second third fourth and fifth metatarsals which form the bulk of the arch of the foot and the body of the foot we have 14 phalanges including in the second through fifth digits on each foot the proximal phalanx middle phalanx and distal phalanx of each digit except for the hallux which has a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx there are 14 phalanges in each hand 14 in each foot 14 plus 14 is 28 if we add 28 for the feet that gives us a total of 56 there are only 206 bones in the body and if we take out the phalanges that leaves 150 so much easier here we have a medial view of the tarsals do you recognize talus and calcaneus the medial cuneiform and navicular here we have talus you can see that smooth curved surface on the proximal aspect of talus calcaneus navicular which helps us navigate to the medial intermediate and lateral cuneiforms and cuboid this picture can help you practice labeling the tarsals this is located in the regular powerpoint presentation that's located on blackboard there are three arches of the foot which act to absorb shock. What happens is these arches flatten when weight is applied, absorbing energy, and then they rebound when weight is removed. That is what gives us spring to our step. These arches also serve to distribute body weight throughout the entire foot. We can see the highest and longest of the three arches is the one with which most people are familiar this goes from points a to c and is known as the medial longitudinal arch there is also a lateral longitudinal arch and just proximal to the ball of the foot we have the anterior transverse arch When people walk on their toes or have excess pressure, depending on the type of shoes or type of work that they do, as in what happens when people dance in toe shoes for a living, that will cause biomechanical stress on the distal aspect of the metatarsals as well as on the pros proximal aspect of the proximal phalanges and those biomechanical changes not only affect these areas of the foot they will actually also cause more biomechanical stress through the tarsals through the um, joints of the ankle the knees the hips the back 
this can cause biomechanical changes literally um, all the way up the spine because it puts abnormal pressure due to the distribution of weight that occurs. And so we can see uh, stress fractures even right here on this x-ray. Club feet are a deformity that can occur inside the womb as a baby is developing. And this deformity will be present at birth. It's usually due to the fact that ligaments or leg muscles have been shortened or tightened while the baby was forming in the womb. This is not painful to an infant. Sometimes it can also be linked to smoking during pregnancy or families with a history of club foot. And most cases can easily be corrected without surgery. It just usually requires either corrective casting or bracing that's done in the first two weeks of life. Here we have a wonderful little picture that again, you can use the PowerPoint slide in the regular PowerPoint presentation as a practice sheet. You can also search for unlabeled pictures of the skeleton online to practice labeling the bones. <laughs> I love these little pieces of bone humor. Uh, you can look at this at your discretion or use it. And this concludes our PowerPoint presentation for the appendicular skeleton.